Welcome to orientation. Presented by the U.S. Strategic Service. My name's Eric and I will be your instructor for this session. First and foremost, this presentation sets precedence while working for this agency. We do this in hopes to clarify what employment looks like and how you can be most successful in this role. So with that being said, let's begin. Again, this presentation is brought to you by the Strategic Service, which was founded in 2017 and sought to resolve the absence of standardized practices and training in the U.S. physical security market. And since its founding, we have reached over 2,000 organizations, much in the same way we are reaching you today. An overview of this presentation will focus on employment requirements, our uniform dress code, grooming and hygiene standards, post responsibilities, and company guidelines. First, we're gonna start with the boring stuff, get it out of the way so that we can move on to the things that actually matter. Employment is conditional upon successful completion of a drug test, satisfactory background investigation, acceptance of an assigned schedule, orientation, and on the job training. All applicants must take and pass the drug screen before being offered a position of employment. Section one, officer requirements. All officers are required to maintain reliable transportation to and from their assigned posts. An inability to report and or a schedule refusal based on transportation may result in disciplinary action and or dismissal. Any convictions for felonies or certain misdemeanors will disqualify applicants from employment at hiring or upon conviction. Any discovery of convictions that were not disclosed during the application process will result in termination of employment due to falsification of information on your application for employment. New convictions must be reported immediately. Failing to do so may result in disciplinary action up to and including termination of employment. Drug use is strictly prohibited during employment. All applicants must pass a drug screen before any offer of employment may be made. The drug screen will detect any illegal substances or masking agents present. Notify the staff before taking the drug screen of any prescription medication which may show up on the drug screen or may prevent you from performing the minimum requirements of the position. Failing the drug screen will result in dismissal from the application process. All officers are required to have a working smartphone device so that they can receive after hours instructions, communications, and view their assigned schedules. Officers who do not have a working phone number will be considered unavailable and will be subject to disciplinary action and or termination of employment. Officers must inform management immediately of any changes to their contact information or availability. All officers may be required to work nights, holidays, and weekends if they fall on their regularly scheduled shift day. Employment is conditional upon acceptance of assigned schedules. Refusing a schedule may result in dismissal from employment consideration or disciplinary action up to and including termination of employment. Your agency may elect to modify locations or hours worked within your availability. Section two, uniform dress code. When reporting to work, you must report in the proper uniform for your post. Perception is reality. So the first step to great service is a great appearance. Items for duty include a notepad with two pens, flashlight for hours of darkness or emergency situations, if armed, a duty belt with firearm and extra ammunition, thermals for cold weather, and duty gloves. Necklaces and medallions must be tucked inside the officer's t-shirt. Men cannot wear earrings of any type while on duty or in uniform. Women can only wear small stud earrings. Facial piercings and tattoos are not permitted. All headgear must be company issued or approved. Footwear must be solid black in color. Boots, dress shoes, and all black tennis shoes are permitted. Shoes must be closed toe. Socks must be dark in color, preferably black. 
Footwear should be durable and comfortable to stand in for 8 to 12 hours. The company issued uniform shirt is the only shirt authorized for wear. The uniform shirt may not be altered in any manner. Undershirts must be white colored crew neck without any markings or writings on it. Personal ballistic vests may be worn under the uniform shirt. Pants must be the issued uniform pants unless otherwise authorized. Denim, suede, cargo, tactical, or leather pants are not permitted. Pants should be hemmed at the midpoint of the back of the shoe. Baggy pants or high waters are not permitted. A plain black belt with a simple buckle is required. Jackets and coats can only be windbreaker or bomber in style. Only jackets and coats issued or approved by the company may be worn. Badge, nameplate, and patch must be worn and visible on the outermost garment. Patches, badges, nameplates, epaulets, rank, and ribbons are authorized to be worn on the company-issued uniform. They must be worn in accordance with uniform standards. Any military award ribbons may be worn with your uniform after proof of award has been submitted and approved by Human Resources. This is an example of properly wearing a security uniform. The name plate is one eighth of an inch above and centered on the right pocket. The badge is above the left pocket affixed in the provided eyelets. Rank, if issued, is aligned to the center point of the collar. And the firearm holster, if armed, is worn on the strong side on the hip only. When discussing uniform care, uniform shirts and pants may be washed in warm water, tumble dry on low. Dry cleaning is the best option for maintaining the uniform, however. Badges and patches must be returned to the company within seven days of leaving employment, even if you do not intend to sell back the rest of the uniform. Criminal charges will be pursued if these items are not returned. These charges may lead to revocation of your security license and prevent future employment in the security industry. Section 3. Grooming and Hygiene Hair must be clean and business professional in appearance and worn in a manner that would not inhibit the normal wear of company-issued or approved headwear. If dyed or treated, hair must be of a natural color. Any articles worn in the hair must be simple in design and subdued in color. Men and women's hair cannot touch or extend past the collar of the uniform shirt. Male employees shall maintain a clean shaven appearance. No beards, long sideburns below the ear, or goatees are allowed. Exceptions include a neatly trimmed mustache, facial hair for medical needs requiring evidence to be submitted to human resources for approval of a waiver. Medical need standards call for the facial hair to be trimmed no longer than one eighth of an inch. And facial hair which meets the religious exception. Everyone is expected to present a clean and sharp image at all times. Officers are expected to maintain an adequate level of hygiene and grooming practices as well as to report to work in a pressed and clean uniform. Failing to do so will result in disciplinary action. This is because, again, great service starts with a great appearance, and perception is reality. And if you show up to your work site looking like a true professional, the client and the public will treat you as such. Additionally, when working in close proximity with other coworkers, whether in a vehicle or a guard shack or an office, it is quite obviously not preferred that the person that you're working with does not maintain adequate levels of personal hygiene. Therefore, to improve the work experience within this agency, you are expected to maintain adequate levels of hygiene so that you do not offend your coworkers. And later on, when we get into use of force training, you may begin to understand why a great officer presence can deter 90% of your problems. Section four, post responsibilities. 
All post responsibilities can be found in the post orders. When in doubt, always check the post orders for guidance. You are expected to read and become familiar with all post orders for posts at which you are assigned. Reporting on and off duty. All officers are required to be at their post and ready to work at the scheduled start time of their shift. Excessive tardiness or absenteeism may be grounds for disciplinary action up to and including termination of employment. If running late for a shift or unable to work a shift, call your supervisor or the security operations center, not the client. If unable to work a shift, call your supervisor or security operations center no later than four hours before the scheduled shift start. Calls placed less than four hours before shift start will be considered an improper call off and may result in disciplinary action. However, this does not mean that a call off with more than four hours of notice is viewed as an approved call off. Simply understand that this is an additional charge of improper call off when made with less than four hours of notice. Any officer absent for more than two consecutive days must provide written documentation detailing the reason for the absence. When reporting on and off duty or clocking in and out, you must use the company time and attendance application or call the security operations center. Reporting on duty while not on post is considered theft of time and is considered a terminable offense. You can clock in and out by calling the Security Operations Center and using your name and employee ID number. Officers will, under no circumstances, leave their posts unless relieved by a properly trained officer. If an officer's relief has not arrived, the officer should immediately contact their supervisor and the Security Operations Center. Post abandonment constitutes resignation without notice. Any officer who fails to report to their scheduled shift without calling the Security Operations Center or supervisor will be considered a no-call no-show and will be considered to have resigned without notice, outside of exigent circumstances, of course. Time off requests must be submitted in writing to the officer supervisor and human resources at least one week prior to the dates being requested. Time off requests are not guaranteed and should be considered unapproved until instructed otherwise. Officers are advised not to purchase non-refundable tickets, passes, trips, etc. until they have been advised that their time off request is approved. An officer is directly responsible for their assigned shift until a time off request is approved. If a holiday falls on an officer's regularly scheduled shift, they will be expected to work it. Vacation or time off requests may not be approved for holidays. Any call offs on a holiday may result in termination of employment as a holiday call off is considered a terminable offense. Section five, company guidelines. Officers are not to disclose any information regarding clients, potential clients, or past clients. All client information is strictly confidential. The client should always be referred to the region commander or corporate for any questions or complaints that they may have. Officers are not to discuss any agency matters with clients or any other parties outside of the agency. Any officer that fails to file this directive and or discloses confidential information is subject to termination of employment for violation of non-disclosure. Officers are not to give interviews or statements to the media under any circumstances. Now let me clarify this one a little bit because a lot of people don't understand exactly what non-disclosure means. This is as simple as complaining to the client that you don't like that your time off request wasn't approved. You don't complain to a client or an employee of a client that you don't like your supervisor or that you don't agree with the way that the company is ran. Additionally, non-disclosure also bars you from speaking to a client after you've been separated from that assignment. 
and it happens all too often when a guard gets a little too comfortable with a client and if employment is separated they then contact that client to attempt to bring them on to whatever agency that guard has moved on to. This is a violation of non-disclosure and can be sought after in civil court if violated. Employees shall under no circumstances fraternize with any employee or employees of the company or a client's company. Non-compliance may lead to termination of employment. This guideline specifically focuses on again getting a little too comfortable with the client or an employee of the client. And it also extends to residents of a residential site that you may work at. For example, you should not attend tenant gatherings if you're not scheduled to work and authorized by the client to do so. You shouldn't be hanging out with employees of the client outside of work hours. And my God, you certainly should not be dating a client, an employee of a client, or a tenant of a property in which you secure. Each of those circumstances leads to horrible outcomes, which at the very least may result in your dismissal from employment. But it can, again, graduate up to civil litigation if guidelines or contract terms were violated in the process. Harassment and assault is not tolerated. Anyone found to be engaging in harassment or assault of any type will be subject to disciplinary investigation and or action depending on the results of a thorough investigation. Any employee who wants to report an incident of harassment should promptly report the matter to their immediate supervisor, human resources representative, or operations manager. The disciplinary action taken for violations of company policies will be determined by the severity of the violation. Formal disciplinary actions may include verbal reprimands, written reprimands, suspension, probation, forfeiture of accrued leave, monetary reimbursement, or termination of employment. The agency reserves the right to determine the severity of an offense and ensure that the punishment fits the offense in the interest of identifying violations early on to prevent reoccurrence. The goal of a disciplinary process is not to identify people who we need to get rid of. It's to identify violations early on to prevent reoccurrence as the slide stated. This means that sometimes when we issue paperwork in the disciplinary process, it's because we see room for improvement. It does not mean that you are a bad employee it doesn't mean that we think that you can't rise to the occasion of the post that you're assigned to. It means that we're trying to help you hit the mark on whatever it is that you're falling short of. But the goal of the disciplinary process, like I said, is to identify violations early on so that we can address, mentor, and prevent reoccurrence and therefore secure your future within this agency. Terminable offenses represent those offenses that are classified as so severe that their acts misrepresent the agency, its clients, or their combined interests to the point that further employment is not feasible. Some examples of terminable offenses include, but are not limited to, failure to comply with company standards, insubordination, unauthorized use of communication devices, unauthorized disclosure, tardiness or absenteeism, unprofessional behavior, failure to report injuries and accidents, falsifying records, unauthorized solicitation, gambling, conflicts of interest, neglect of duty, unauthorized use of equipment, failure to maintain alertness, unauthorized visitors, assignment refusal, destruction of property, unlawful and unauthorized carrying of weapons, indecent behavior, improper communication, illegal or unauthorized drug use, and theft. Schedules are either posted for acknowledgement and review, or your supervisor will provide you with a copy via email or text message. Every officer is responsible for acknowledging and verifying their own schedule. Schedules should be retained in the event of scheduling errors. Anyone injured on the job must immediately report it to the Security Operations Center. The injured employee will be given direction by the dispatcher. 
A field supervisor will be dispatched to provide assistance and investigate the incident. The injured employee must complete paperwork and tests provided by the field supervisor. And that concludes this portion of the orientation. I'll now turn you back over to your agency and I wish you the best of luck in your employment. Thank you.